Okay, great. Well, hi everyone. Um, today I'm going to do a presentation for you on a triple cascade failure and, and how we conduct a dam break assessment. So, first off, dam breaks. What are they? Why do we do them? What's the big issue? Well, as I'm sure pretty much everyone in this room knows, um, a big byproduct of the mining industry is tailings. This is a contaminated waste product which you don't want touching the environment and you normally store it in a TSF or a tailings storage facility. Now, that's all very well and good. But what happens if the dam breaks? You can get some pretty disastrous consequences. These have economic, environmental, and sadly, a lot of these, they also lead to a loss of life. Um, and a big dam break uh, failure that happened in recent times was Jezus Fontaine in 2022. And these aren't isolated incidents because in 2022 alone, there were six dam break failures. And this is some of the damage that can occur. So I'm going to take you through an example of a dam break assessment that I did. And hopefully you can learn a little something from it. Um, I will keep the location of the mine confidential, but I think it should get the idea across. So here's a basic layout of our site. It's a bit basic, as I say. It's, <laughs> I'm trying to keep it confidential. But you get the general idea. There's a TSF, we'll call that TSF1. And then immediately downstream is a clarification pond. Now, the plan of the study was to build a second TSF abutting right against this initial TSF, we'll call that TSF2. And the issue with this is it could lead to a triple cascade failure. Now, I've said how damaging a single dam break could be. But imagine a failure where TSF1 collapses into TSF2, TSF2 collapses into the clarification pond, and then the clarification pond collapses to the environment. It could be disastrous. So before you start any dam break assessment, you need to look at your credible failure modes. So what are these? Now, it's very unlikely that these dams are going to fail. So you need to come up with a feasible reason that they'll actually break. So there are a number of credible failure modes. First off, you've got an earthquake, or perhaps overtopping, where the basin fills with water due to a pumping failure or an extreme rainfall event. A foundational failure. Maybe you've got boggy or loose sand, boggy ground or loose sand underneath your dam. That could cause, that could slip and cause your dam to slip. Internal erosion, where you've got a single point in the middle of the dam, gets eroded and eroded and eroded until the thing collapses from the center. Or you could have a slope failure, where you've got a bit of a change in pressures on the outside of the dam, which leads to a slip. So we had a look at these for our dams. And we'll start with TSF1. Earthquake, not going to happen. It's in a real non-earthquake prone zone. Overtopping? Well, for this, we looked into the maximum possible precipitation that could occur. That's physically the maximum amount of rainfall which can happen. And we looked at a 72-hour period, so there's quite a lot of rainfall. And TSF1 could hold all of that and then a little bit more. So overtopping, unlikely. Foundational failure? Well, it's boggy ground underneath our dam, but we've accounted for that in the design. So that's not going to happen. Now, internal erosion is possible. But because we're building a second TSF immediately downstream of this first one, and it wasn't originally designed for that, we think that is our credible failure mode. Now, for the other two facilities, the choice is simple. Because this TSF1 is going to overtop, it's going to send a bunch of material down, and it's going to overtop the two of them. So great. Credible failure modes, done. Now for our outflow volumes. So this is an important time to note you never just do one dam break assessment. You always do two. You do a sunny day, which is just under normal conditions, or you do a rainy day, where you've got an extreme rainfall event occurring at the same time as your dam break. And in this case, we use that 72-hour probable maximum precipitation I used earlier. So let me take you back to this. And this is the issue with assessing the outflow volumes. If you notice, none of these dams when they've collapsed, have led to all of the tailings flowing out. Only a certain percentage actually leaves the facility. So you've got to sort of estimate how much is going to flow out of your TSF. And for that, you need to calculate possible failure slope, and then assume it radiates back from the breach point and get a conical failure cone. So if you look at this diagram, only the bit below the blue dashed line is actually going to collapse. Everything below the brown line is going to remain in the facility. And if I take you back to here, you can see that only the dashed area is going to collapse. 
the rest of it will stay where it is. And we could evaluate our estimates based on literature and historical data, and you can see it quite simply fits the curve. And I should point out that for the clarification pond, we didn't have to go to these lengths. Because it's water, it's just all going to flow out. So that one was pretty easy. So, rheology. So why doesn't it all flow out? Well, that's because tailings have quite a high solids content. And so we had to find out when our dam collapsed, or if it collapsed, because this is hypothetical, whether the flow would be Newtonian or non-Newtonian. So just to take you through the difference, Newtonian flows, that's like water. But something with a high solids content, like tailings, that exhibits behavior more like, say, peanut butter or toothpaste. It takes a lot of force to get it moving, and then once it does start moving, it doesn't exhibit linear characteristics. Now, based on the amount of tailings that would flow out of RTSFs, and due to the fact that they're going to mix with the supernatant water on top of the tailings, we theorize that the mass solids concentration was probably going to be less than about 70% solids by mass. As you can see, this tends towards zero of the slow yield stress. And because of that, we are happy to consider that when the breach happened, it would be a Newtonian breach, and it would flow like water, which I was quite happy about because it made it a little easier to model. So, great, we've got our outflow volumes. Now we need to work out our breach hydrographs, because obviously, when it breaches, it's not just all out in one go. It comes out slowly over a period of time. Now we looked at four different methods to assess this. These are regression equations defined based on breaches from water dams. And we wanted to go for the worst case scenario. So we took the regression equation which gave us the highest peak outflow. And that was Frolic 2016. So I'll take you through, through the results now. So this first one is for TSF1 the most upstream TSF. And it's about what we'd expect. There's a single outflow peak, and you can see, in fact, it's the blue line slash the sort of gray dashed line on that graph. Quite a simple graph. But this is where it actually gets quite interesting. So TSF2 doesn't exhibit quite the same pattern. We've got a double breach. Now, when we first set out to do this, we assumed that there was just going to be a bunch of water piling up behind these dams, being released all at once. In fact, we see a bit of attenuation. We see a staggering effect. What happens is TSF1 breaches into TSF2. But then TSF2 overtops before the peak flood wave of TS TSF1 comes through, which means you get an initial breach, and then you get a secondary breach when the flood wave from TSF2 rolls on by. And so the clarification pond gets a little bit more confusing because you get this effect three times. So you get a triple flood wave coming through, all staggered because there's attenuation in each facility. Okay, so now we're on to the easier part of this, which is the modeling. We've got all our inputs. They include the outflow hydrographs I've just gone over, um, rainfall data for the rainy day scenario, and topography, because we need to know exactly where our water is going to go. And the results from this are actually quite fun. You, you get a little bit of a video which you can track. Now, I wasn't able to get a video for you, I'm afraid, and I have, for confidentiality, had to remove the actual aerial image, but hopefully you'll get a bit of an idea of what goes on. So you can see starts, breaches, flows via the natural flow path. Okay, that's our modeling done. We're pretty much done, over. But wait, we need to do a consequence classification as well. There's no point us just defining where this goes and leaving it there. We need to actually think, how does this impact areas downstream? So for this, we use the Canadian Dam Association guidelines. Now they've got four things to look out for. Population at risk, the potential loss of life, environmental and cultural values, and infrastructure and economics. So, the population at risk and loss of life. Now, it's a quantitative assessment you've got to do. You've got to look at the houses downstream, the businesses. You'll think, who's going to be in there at the time that this breaks? How many people aren't going to be available to evacuate? And then you've got environmental and cultural values and economics and infrastructure. That's a little bit more qualitative because you're just judging on whether it's going to be a large damage to the environment, which will be impossible to recover from, or possibly 
won't be that bad. And lakes and streams will recover in no time. And again, infrastructure and economics, you've got to make an estimate of what is downstream, how much that will cost, and possibly the amount of businesses that will affect, and livelihoods that will affect. And so this is the overall result that we got. So as I said, the uh, dam classification um, is based on these four factors. Uh, we judged the people living downstream as being permanent residents because there was housing rather than just purely businesses. Well, the loss of life, we found possibly 10 people or less could die from this dam. So this really hammers home how relevant doing these dam break assessments are. You've got to really make sure that you classify your dam and that you act upon the dam break assessment. The environmental and cultural values, as I said, qualitative. We found that it was a significant loss or deterioration to important fish and wildlife. And we found it highly possible that it could be restored, which is good news overall for the dam owners, but I still wouldn't want to see the area being flooded. And for infrastructure and economics, we found that there were some recreational facilities that would be damaged, and there were some infrequently used transportation routes which would be damaged. It's not like there was a massive city downstream which would be wiped out as soon as this dam breaks set and yeah, this breach failed. So that's how you complete a dam break assessment. And hopefully you've learned a little something from this. And thank you very much for listening. And I'd like to open the floor to any questions.